Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. It's entitled, Accurate Prediction of On- and Off-Target Cardiotoxicity with Human iPSC-Derived Cardiomyocytes. One of the leading causes of failure for new drug compounds has been the lack of appropriate in vitro models that fail to recapitulate important aspects of cardiac biology. The ongoing development of induced pluripotent stem cell technology carries great promise for early predictive detection of cardiotoxicity. When combined with current high-throughput screening methods in pharmacogenomics, we may soon realize the full potential of personalized medicine. Those are among the topics our panel will address today, so let's meet our speakers. Blake Hansen, product manager at CDI, will introduce us to some of the basics behind the development of the iCell cardiomyocytes and the different applications for which they have been utilized. Dale Baker, research scientist of exploratory toxicology at Celgene, will discuss data from studies on HERG cardiac ion channels, along with their usefulness in the drug discovery process. Matt Peters, principal scientist of discovery technology at AstraZeneca, will describe his work on developing sensitive cardiac toxicity screening methods using stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. Before our speakers get started, I want to encourage you to submit questions for a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. We'll try and answer as many as we can. Simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen, and then hit submit. So if everyone's ready, let's get the webinar going. Blake, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we'll be talking about using stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes in toxicity testing, specifically I-cell cardiomyocytes. I'm going to have, keep my part very brief, and the agenda for my talk will simply be looking at uh, an overview of cellular dynamics, the company, IPSC technology, then moving into I-cell cardiomyocytes, as well as then really just a brief uh, look at the advantages of using human stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. You'll hear more about the specific examples and advantages from the following speakers. So to get started, um, Cellular Dynamics is the world's largest provider of stem cells and stem cell-derived tissue cells. Really, we've accomplished this by focusing on four competencies. That is the generation and culture of these cells, genetic engineering uh, for suitable endpoints, developing new differentiation protocols to make new cell types, and finally producing these cell types at an industrial scale. In order to do this, we've developed an extensive IP portfolio and have really assembled probably one of the world's finest um, um, staff at culturing, creating, and differentiating these cells. Uh, we refer to this as the uh, stem cell operating system, and our products can de be de uh, fall into two separate primary buckets. One is our vanilla off-the-shelf ISIL products, which we see here, a, a listing of a variety of cell types, as well as in a custom manufacturing uh, uh, production where we will take in donors or samples of choice, be it from diseases, clinical trials, or just special populations of interest, and then make the cell types of choice for you, the customer. All right. Um, Really, the way we do this, or I mean, I'm sorry, to, to center on the technology that we're going to be talking about today, um, I want to run through this uh, slide very briefly. This is induced pluripotent stem cell technology, where we have acquired a sample. That sample, that somatic cell sample, typically a blood sample, is reprogrammed into stem cells. Those cells are then expanded and banked um, into a, a large master and working banks. From each working bank, then, you can derive the various cell types of choice. Each new manufacturing batch will go back to that working cell bank, and so the real advantage here is that you're eliminating batch-to-batch -batch or experiment-to-experiment -experiment variability while being able to introduce population or genetic diversity. And one of the advantages of cellular dynamics is that we have scaled this up, as mentioned before, so we can make literally billions of cell types or billions of cells from a specific cell type. This enables the end user to have high quality, highly consistent product on demand. All right, we're going to really focus on the stem cell derived cardiomyocytes today. So I-cell cardiomyocytes are a cryopreserved product that when thawed form a fully functional syncytial monolayer of cardiomyocytes that beat spontaneously. As you'll see, these cells exhibit the normal human biology and they're really the industry standard. 
where they've got a broad platform uh, utility, a very large um, uh, literature database, and they're really being used by the, the majority of the top pharmaceutical companies. All right, this will be the only characterization slide uh, that we present. And uh, just suffice it to say that these cells, cardiomyocytes, have the appropriate ge um, genetic expression profile. Their protein expression profile is one that subserves their function. That is, you've got sarcomeric formation so they can contract. The metabolic activity mimics that of the adult cardiomyocytes, where it's mitochondrial-based but can, but can become glycolytic under appropriate conditions. The biochemical pathways are all there, so one can look at GPCR and kinase pathways. And you've got the appropriate functionality, that is the translation from electrical events down to mechanical or contractile activity. Really, it provides a, a fully functional human cardiac prep that allows easy translation to the native condition. I think the real advantage of using stem cell technology, and specifically human stem cell technology, is that it provides a contextual relevance for your experiments. That is, in the case of stru structural toxicity, you're looking at that structural toxicity in a metabolically and mechanically active cardiomyocyte. Similarly, for functional toxicity, you've got the appropriate functional pathways, um, electrical to calcium signaling, to mechanical activity. And one of the real advantages to using a PrEP like this is that you've got that contextual relevance where functional or mechanical activity can exacerbate structural toxicities and structural toxicities can affect functional activity. So you've really got the appropriate feedback and interplay. You'll hear a couple of uh, great examples of how the cells are being used, but I also refer you to our uh, um, our uh, citation index as well, where we can see well over 40 peer-reviewed publications that can cover both toxicity testing as well as drug development. In addition to really being uh, customer qualified, these cells are also gathering or garnering the attention of the regulatory agencies where they're being fully used in developing the new comprehensive in vitro proarrhythmia assay, as well as starting to be included in some of the IND filings that have been submitted by customers. So all in all, we're really seeing the IPSC technology um, come into its uh, fruition, and we'll hear more about that shortly. So with that, I say thank you and turn it over to the next speakers. Blake, uh, thank you very much. That was a great presentation to get us started. And he provided us with some excellent insight on the versatility of iCell cardiomyocytes. Thank you. Before we move on to Dale Baker's presentation, let me again invite you to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of all the presentations. Simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and then hit submit. Uh, the speakers will try to get to as many as possible. Our next speaker is Dale Baker, and he is ready and raring to get going. Dale? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so the title of my talk is uh, HERG e -cipher Cardio, which is a multi-electrode array assay, and dog telemetry, and it's a retrospective analysis. So just a quick outline of my, uh, my talk. I'm going to give an introduction, a HERG background, an uh, overview of the HERG assay as we know it, um, our compound X background, and yes, because of legal, it's compound X. Um, e our e cipher cardio assay, which is our multi electrode array assay, uh, the dog telemetry study, a summary, and conclusions. So let's get started. So, cardiovascular toxicity is a potential side effect of many discovery and development compounds. Additionally, cardiovascular toxicities have been a major reason for many post market withdrawals. A lot of those uh, fun players are Seldane, which is terfenidine, which we actually use as a positive control in a lot of our cardiotox assays. Bextra, which is valdecoxib, and Viox, which is, of course, everyone knows. And, of course, early evaluation of cardiovascular toxicities is a priority of both regulatory authorities um, as well as uh, biopharmaceuticals and pharmaceuticals industry utilizing in vitro and in vivo preclinical models. So before we go on, I wanted to go over a little bit about the uh, cardiac electrical activity and a primer. So in the heart, the atrial depolarization event is initiated by the sinoatrial node, which causes the P wave, and you can actually see that as a, the ECG uh, wave on your right. Next, the atrial depolarization completes, and the impulse gets delayed at the 
uh, AV node, atrioventricular node, and that's that pause between the P and the Q wave there. Once that happens, ventricular depolarization completes or begins, and that's actually the QRS wave here, causing the QRX complex, and then atrial repolarization occurs. After that, uh, ventricular depolarization completes, and actually this is the pause between the S and T wave. And then once this occurs, we actually have ventricular repolarization beginning at the apex causing the T wave. And this, the T wave is actually what we're really interested in in, in some of the next slides, and I'll go over that a little bit more. And then the next thing is just actually the pause after the T wave, actually after the repolarization completes. So back to my introduction slide, many of the cardiovascular toxicities are a result of blocking cardiovascular ion channels such as sodium, potassium, and calcium. And one such ion channel that we're really interested in is a potassium channel called HERG. So the HERG channel, for a little bit of background, is actually the human ether agogo related gene, and it's a gene that codes for a protein known as KV11.1, or a potassium ion channel. And HERG contributes to the electrical activity of the heart that coordinates the heart's beating by mediating ventricular rep repolarization of IKR, which is the in inward rectifier, rapidly delayed rectifier current, in the cardiac action potential. Inhibition of this HERG channel can result in long QT syndrome or cardiac arrhythmia, such as torsade de point, which is literally means the twisting of the points, which can degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. And below you'll see actually a regular, regular rhythm followed by a TDP at the end here where it degenerates into this uh, ventricular fib fibrillation. So when we look at um, HERG blockade at a molecular level, cellular level, and tissue level, it's actually very interesting, uh, the chain of events. You can actually see at the molecular level, we have the drug inhibiting the HERG channel. We actually, at the cellular level, we actually have, have an inhibition of the action potential. We see here the black line is a normal. The red line is actually inhibition of the HERG channel. You see this uh, inhibition of the uh, HERG channel there. And then when you actually look t at the tissue level, at the ECG, you can see the prolongation of the T wave as well uh, in, the red, in the red here. So how do we actually measure HERG in vitro? So we actually take, uh, we actually do this at a CRO. We actually have uh, HEC-293 cells transfected to stably express the HERG potassium channels. We use uh, patch clamp electrophysi electrophysiology recordings at the single cell level, measuring millivolt changes. We run this in eight, uh, eight doses in a dose response curve, and we use quinidine or terfenidine used as a positive control. And as I mentioned earlier, terfenidine, which was celdane, um, is actually a good positive control in this assay. Um, so we actually measure uh, HERG in a couple of different ways. We actually have a manual patch clamp, which is actually a single cell assay, and this is our gold standard where actually uh, you have a one cell in a Petri dish, you take a glass pipette, you pull suction on it, and you actually have full cell recording. Once the membrane breaks open, you actually have full cell recording here. Um, kind of a, a faster version, we actually have a 3 and a 4 well based uh, plate version which actually the cells fall down onto the micro openings, and the same thing occurs. You have suction, the membrane breaks open, and you have full cell recording that way. And again, this is how we measure these action potentials, as I mentioned earlier. So this is just an idea of what these rigs look like. The manual, the manual uh, assay is actually run by a trained electrophysiologist. It's actually in a Faraday cage to uh, keep out any kind of electrical interference for this because it's a very sensitive assay. And on the right is actually the automated assay. It's, it's kind of nice that it's all in one, in one unit. Um, you, they come in multiple well types, 96 through 84, and there's actually some uh, 16 and 24 well assays as well. Getting into our Compound X background, and sorry that it's Compound X uh, legal made me keep it as Compound X, but it is a multi-kinase inhibitor. And what we noticed is we actually had some pretty low HERG values. So our automated patch clamp came in 11.9 micromolar. When we reran it in the manual patch clamp, was what we normally do, it came back at 9.3 micromolar. And so we had some questions, and we wanted to know if the low HERG IC50 would actually translate into functional effects in vitro on human myocardiomyocytes, which should encompass all major cardiac ion channels. And this is actually one of our CRO-based assays. It's the Cipertex eCypher cardio assay, which is run in the induced pluripotent uh, cardiomyocytes. And then also, uh, the next question we had was, will this translate into functional effects in vivo in a telemetrized dog study? So uh, summary thus far, actually, it's very quick. I have two HERG assays, uh, automated patch clamp 11.9 micromolar and the manual patch clamp of 9.3 micromolar.
A little bit of background on the eCypher Cardio Multi-Electrode Array Assay. It's uh, in 48 well microplates. They're induced pluripotent stem cells from our sponsor, CDI, and they're in 10% serum. Cells are a mixture of spontaneously electrical active atrial, nodal, and ventricular-like myocytes. Plating and maintenance before the assay begins takes 14 to 21 days before a stable uh, beating phenotype is seen. Um, with this assay, we run actually a five-point dose response curve uh, in duplicate for each compound. And uh, for this assay, we actually use quinidine uh, as our positive control, and this one also produce, prolongs QT as well. And compound treatment is 45 minutes with real-time tracing in all 48 wells. And data is normalized first to its baseline and then recalculated as a percent of the vehicle treated control wells. So a little bit of uh, background on the actual assay itself. It uh, utilizes an Axion Biosystems MEA system, the Maestro system. And what's really interesting about this, we actually get a, a lot of different measurements out of here. So we get the beat period, which is the time. We get the sodium slope, which is the conduction velocity, or V over S. Our sodium amplitude, which is our action potential, our millivolt changes. We also get uh, fuel potential duration, which is actually our measure of QT. And then what also this brings is we actually get to see some of these early after depolarization events, which actually uh, translates pretty well into an arrhythmia potential. So this figure is from SI et al. And what, what this shows is actually really nice. Everything's on the same timeline. We actually have uh, ECG on the top. We have a microelectrode array trace in the middle. And we actually have the action potential on the bottom. And as you can see, the, uh, the, the prolonged QT, which is the red line, actually lines up pretty well uh, amongst all these things, showing that there should be a pretty good correlation between the patch clamp, the MEA, and the ECG in vivo. So when we actually look at the data from the multi-electrode array, um, what's interesting is we have this T wave here um, showing here, and this, the little bar here is that there's a QT interval which is showed here. Unfortunately, um, in the MEA traces, there's only a Q, it's basically a Q wave, there's no QRS complex. So, but we can still measure the T wave, and you notice that uh, the, right, the right side is uh, treatment and the left side is baseline. You'll notice at 10 micromolar of compound X, we lose the T wave. And then you'll notice as we get into higher concentrations, the T wave's still gone. But now what we see is we see additional things happening. We actually see these early after depolarization events that occur, these red arrows. And also, we also see an increased beat period. Um, you notice that the timing between the uh, different the peaks here are, are getting longer, and that actually de translates to decreased beat rate. So when we actually look at all the parameters that I mentioned earlier, um, so the MEC, the minimum effective concentration, is donate, uh, denoted by these black circles here. And you notice that for the average fuel potential duration, the purple line, um, the, the minimum effective concentration is 10 micromolar, which lines up exactly with our HERG values. And you notice there are also changes in other events as well. The beat period actually increases, which actually is a, translates into decreased uh, heart rate. We actually have a conduction velocity decrease, and we also have an action potential decrease. So these are changes that happen, although they're not happening at 10 micromolar, they're happening at 31.6 micromolar, they are still occurring. So the summary thus far is we have, of course, the HERG assay is around 10 micromolar. We have the field potential duration, um, minimum effective concentration around 10. And then we see a lot of these other effects that occur at greater than 31.6 micromolar. So, so far, the HERG, the e for cardio assay is, is uh, matching up pretty well with the HERG assay. All right, so now the next question was, how does this translate in vivo? So we actually set up a dog radio telemetry study, and we wanted to assess the potential acute effects of oral gavage of our compound X on arterial blood flow, pressure, heart rate, body temperature, and lead to ECG in con conscious uh, radio telemetry instrumented male deep beagle dogs. Uh, we set this up, and we actually had three treatment groups, uh, actually four treatment groups if you can count the vehicle. Um, so we have the vehicle, we have a 5, 15, and 30 mg per kg dose groups, uh, four, four dogs per group. And actually, I put the CMAX levels here you could actually, so you could actually see the micromolar concentrations that it's equivalent to. With one caveat that uh, at, at 30 mg per kg, uh, three animals had to be sacrificed due to uh, GI tox. So most of the readings, all the readings at uh, the 30 mg per kg group are just from one animal. So when we looked at the data, the PR interval time, um, there was a change at the 15 mg per kg group. There was a 20% PR, PR interval shortening. 
And what was interesting at the 30 mg per kg group, um, that PR interval shortening at 20% was actually at 10 hours, and then by 18 hours, that PR interval shortened even to 30%. And at 15 mg per kg, it was the 20% shortening was at 12 hours, and there were no changes at 5 mg per kg. So when we look at the QRS interval, um, there were no changes at 5 and 15 mg per kg, but there was a quite a, a interval shortening of the QRS at 30 mg per kg, indicating a change in ventricular depolarization and atrial repolarization, which is, of course, a potential for tachycardia. So when we look at the QTC or the corrected uh, QTC interval, using the van der Waters equation. There was no changes at 5 and 15 mg per kg, but at 30 mg per kg, there was a definite increase in QTC indicated here, and this was, this was at two hours. And of course, a length in QT interval is a marker for potential ventricular tachyrhythmias, like uh, tersade de Plant and a risk factor for sudden death. So in summary of the results, um, our HERGASA results showed uh, automated HERG IC50 of around 12 micromolar, a manual patch clamp HERG IC50 of 9.3. Um, when we look at the eCypher cardio results, the field potential duration matches up with our HERG IC50 is around 10 micromolar. Um, we have a loss of T wave at 10 micromolar, which actually usually precedes early after depolarization events. And of course, we see um, beat period decreases, uh, sodium slope decreases, and amplitude changes at 31.6 micromolar. And, of course, EAD is noted at 31.6 micromolar. When we look at the dog study, we see that there are no findings at 5 mg per kg. There's one finding at 15 mg per kg, which is the 20% shortening of the PR interval. And at 30 mg per kg is where we see all our main changes. And, of course, with only one animal surviving, these doses really weren't tolerated. But there is a 30% shortening of the PR interval and there is a shortening of the QRS interval, indicating a change in atrial repolarization and ventricular depolarization. And, of course, this also is an increase in QTC, uh, indicating a delay in the ventricular repolarization. So my quick summary slide now is that we have the HERG assays and eCypher cardio assays uh, correlating fairly well. And then, we actually, when we do the dog, dog telemetry study, even though the doses aren't quite the same, it is predicting the eCypher cardio that induced pluripotent stem cell cardiomyocyte assay is predicting what we see in the dog telemetry study. So in conclusion, um, the eCypher cardio assay gave a uh, FPD value of 10 micromolar very similar to our HERG IC50 values. Other changes in beat period, sodium slope, and amplitude, as well as EADs were identified in concentrations of greater than or equal to the 31.6 micromolar. Um, our in vivo dog telemetry study with compound X identified changes in the PR interval of both the 15 and 30 mg per kg doses. Um, QT prong elongation was only associated, associated with HERG blockade was only noted at the 30 mg per kg dose. So all in all, the HERG and eCypher cardio assay were able to predict the in vivo outcome fairly well. And uh, in closing, this ESAR for cardio assay um, is an in vitro assay we hope to deploy when functional data is needed for all cardiac ion channels and not just HERG, or when we also need functional confirmation of HERG effects. With that, I'd like to thank uh, my folks at uh, Cell Gene Exploratory Toxicology, Ciprotex, who runs the MEA assay, and uh, Blake at CDI. Great presentation, Dale. Thank you very much. Your talk really accentuated how stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes can link in vitro with in vivo results. Much appreciated. So before we move to our final presentation, we again invite you to submit questions for a Q&A session at the end of the third presentation. Simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and then hit Submit. Matt Peters is set to present the final talk of our webinar. So, Matt, the floor is all yours. So, what I plan to tell you about is um, some work we've done in AstraZeneca using stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes to try to build frontline screens for cardiotoxicity. As most of this audience well knows, that uh, cardiovascular tox is a major cause of drug attrition and withdrawal. And this heuristic slide is not meant to be particularly accurate, but to show you that that a uh, level of concern uh, rivals efficacy portfolio and cost of good failures. And this is true still, despite the fact that we have really good in vivo and ex vivo models for cardiotoxicity. Um, and they have good translation, they're very sophisticated, 
And one example might be uh, dog um, telemetry studies. And within AstraZeneca, we might use dog telemetry when we're down to one or maybe two compounds. And so what you get out of that is a recognition that a compound may have a, a hazard. And you really are left with what I would call a false choice. You either move ahead at risk or you kill a compound that you have invested many years in. And what we'd like to do to change this is to get to where we build uh, frontline assays with the capability of driving SAR and then build uh, safety in by design. And that might change the paradigm here. And consistent with this hypothesis, as most folks will know, is the HERG work, whereby we have now are required to and routinely screen for HERG and related ion channels. And this has dramatically reduced arrhythmia. But that is a molecular perspective, and it leaves quite a bit of a gap uh, in the functional screening area. So if we could address this, maybe we could make a shift in this pie chart on the left. So another way of showing this is to say that we have a whole host of various cardiovascular hazards which we'd like to under, better understand the risk, and I've shown those here at the top. And our routine frontline screens currently uh, across the industry are HERG and related uh, ion channels. And then uh, we go into late phase uh, in vivo studies. So there's quite a gap here, and if we could uh, develop assays that would support earlier detection with diverse risk, allow us to look at me mechanistic studies, develop SAR, and translate to in vivo, this could really change things. And as it happens, most folks will know that we have really good um, technology that is already developed and ready to go. And I've listed a number of them here, but not inclusive. And the, the game changer here is these assays plus the addition of the IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. They bring to this, then, a, a scalable supply that is human-based. So then you might ask, well, now that we've got these cells and we've got these assays, what is the right assay? And I get that question quite a lot, but I think it's the wrong question. It's not what's the right assay, but what's the right cascade? And that leads to very different answers when you ask that question. So when you think about a primary screen, the criteria you would have would certainly be high throughput. You want it to be frontline. You want it to, you really want to avoid false negatives. So you want it to be very inclusive. And to get inclusive, you probably want it downstream in the excitation contraction coupling cascade. You want it to be versatile. You don't want it to be limited to, say, 20 minutes or 20 hours. And you want it to have good translation. So those, are, those would, might be your criteria. But notice how different they are when uh, you're evaluating something that you might use as a secondary or mechanistic study. Here, it's really critical that it be mechanistic appropriate. If you're looking at something that is affecting the, the mechanical contraction, you want to be measuring force, not electrical activity. Um, so you want it to be mechanistic appropriate. You'd like this... Uh, to also be distinct from your primary detection assay. You'd like it to be facile in terms of if you want to do um, a knockdown, you'd like that to be a possibility, and you'd like translation. So very different assays depending on what you want to do. So what I hope to cover, uh, and this, this will serve as an outline, uh, first go over what I think are among the current leading possibilities for primary screens, and then I will uh, carry on and go through each of the various risks uh, as outlined in the top. So let's go to primary screens. Um, the one that is widely used currently is a calcium dye assay, and this shows data, uh, data from the flipper instrument with molecular devices, although there are other instruments out there. Um, and this is from their publication. And you can see here there's an agent that causes a uh, change in peak width. And they can quantitate that in a concentration response mode on the lower uh, graph. And you can see this is percent effect uh, on the y-axis starting at 100%. And as you get departure from that 100%, they call it a point of departure. And a 20% change would certainly be detectable. Very robust data. Um, and it's very high throughput. So this is in 384 mode, and which would be very consistent with a frontline screen. Now, it's not the only choice. Another one that I'll highlight just because of its difference 
is uh, the work from Mark McCullough's group uh, where they have uh, used, again, a calcium-sensitive dye, and I think you can see that each cell, each cardiomyocyte is outlined here in a region of interest. And so they are able, through imaging, to capture each individual cell. And so you can then, um, from there, get ensemble views or individual cardiomyocyte views. You might want to then tease out individual cells or cells that have perhaps um, atrial or ventricular uh, profiles and pull those out. This is commercially available through Val Sciences, um, and you can, you can access as, this as a CRO. It's very high throughput uh, because of its either uh, cell or population views, and it is very robust data. The second one that I think is uh, leading the way is the impedance-based work, and I will focus mostly on that because that's mostly what I have used. Um, and let me introduce this briefly. It uses uh, interdigitated gold film electrodes embedded in the bottom of each well in a 96-well dish. And then the cardiomyocytes are plated to cover these in a confluent layer, and they form a resistive barrier. Um, and that's important because a weak current is applied, and it's not enough to stimulate the cells or to be cytotoxic. It's a minimal amount of current to monitor the current path as it flows through, around, or between the cells. And as it happens, this type of technology is exquisitely sensitive, um, and so it leads to very robust assays. It's particularly sensitive to changes in morphology. And so one version of this technology has um, been developed with the Excelligence Cardio Instrument. And the way that this particular version of the impedance instruments has been developed is to uh, get data update rates of 10 milliseconds roughly. So you can see in this raw data trace, it is simply data points connected by a line. There's no fitting, and you can get very good resolution of the beating. One of the major uh, advantages of this type of technology is that it's label-free. So there's no dye. Uh, there's no radioactivity. You can monitor the cells continuously for as long as you like. And so what I wanted to do in this next graph is show you one advantage, potential advantage, of label-free. So in this, I will use a flipper die, but first in the, but this is in the uh, impedance instrument. So here you can see, I've just for uh, comparison, I've changed media, I've done a media change because the temperature has an effect, and you can see it's fairly stable at around 40 beats per minute. However, if I were to use the flipper-based buffer, just the buffer, uh, you would see that there is a substantial drop in the beat rate. It drops by about half, and this has been helpful for us as we use the flipper to understand uh, that change, that the buffer alone can have an effect because you're no longer in media. Now, if you were to add that calcium-sensing dye in uh, to this, and we know that calcium affects the contraction, uh, then we would see an additional effect, and you can see that it drops and stops the beating um, by four hours. Now, notice there is a window there of around an hour and a half where you get good uh, capability of detecting beating. But it is a narrow window uh, as compared to impedance, and so that's an important difference. So overall, what assay you choose depends on uh, how you're wanting to use it. The impedance assay has the advantage that it's farther downstream. It's detecting the actual morphological changes. It has the advantage that it's more versatile. You can read it any time you like. But it has the disadvantage that it's 96 whereas the flipper instrument is 384. Overall, then, to summarize uh, your assay choice, I think you need to think about where you are in the excitation-contraction coupling cascade. And if you are wanting to look at changes that affect an ion channel, like nifedipine, you certainly uh, might want to focus on something like MEA. Whereas if you're looking at something at blebistatin, which does not affect the uh, the electro electrical beating, but does stop the mechanical beating, then you'd want to be further downstream. And so I think I've well emphasized uh, that the need depends on your use. So now in the last uh, portion of the talk, what I want to do is since I focused on primary screens, one of the criteria I set out at the beginning was it needs to be inclusive. And we've got a series of risks across the top here. 
But what I want to do is very quickly show you some evaluations of these various risks that we've done, done within AstraZeneca and see if it meets some pretty uh, basic criteria. So the first one I'll start with is an example that shows the ability to detect changes in heart rate as well as structural uh, toxicity or cytotoxicity. And this first starts with a premise that we need to make sure that, uh, that uh, we cover, which is the relationship between uh, force and frequency. In a mature heart, as your heart beats faster, it also beats with greater force. So a positive force frequency relationship. As it happens, in stem cells, they are immature and they don't have a fully developed sarcoplasmic reticulum, so they, have, they don't have that positive force frequency relationship. In fact, it's inverted. And so here what I've done is used a newer version of the impedance instrument, which does have the ability to pulse the cells and thereby pace them. And so you can see at different beat rates, which I've set, uh, as, you, as you cause them to beat faster, they beat with less force, excuse me, and they do beat with less force, but here we're detecting that they beat with less amplitude. So that, rela that always assumed relationship between amplitude and force seems to be consistent. But that wasn't what I intended to show you here. What I wanted to show you is that if you understand that the, uh, the negative force frequency relationship, you can understand better some of the findings that you see. And here's one that it's, was initially confusing to folks. Uh, epinephrine, you know that it causes heart rate to increase and it causes force to increase. But in a s stem cell assay, what we're seeing is rate go up and amplitude goes down. So that inverse relationship. Excuse me. Now, that would lead you to the assumption that rate and amplitude are inversely related, which they most often are. But they can be independent variables. And here is an example of a drug that causes at low concentrations, these are the units across the x-axis are arbitrary log units. At low concentrations, the rate in blue is decreased, whereas amplitude is not changing. At higher concentrations, though, then you get a secondary effect, which is they stop beating. Then notice that cell index is a third line on here, and that's very important. It is a clear marker of uh, a number of things, but if you have cell death, um, cell index will change, and it's clearly not changing here. We always include um, an endpoint assay as another marker for cell death, but you can see here that they are stopped, the, the beating has stopped uh, without having cytotoxicity. So these two, in, uh, the main point though is that rate and amplitude tend to vary inversely, as you would expect, but they can be independent. Here is an example of exactly that. This is a pacemaker current inhibitor, and as you would expect, if you block the pacemaker current, you will slow the rate of beating. Notice that the amplitude does not change initially, and this time is at uh, 20 minutes, but if I were to reread this plate, because it's straightforward to do, at 20 hours, not 20 minutes, you can see that uh, the amplitude very much goes up, perhaps in a compensating way. So what I hope I've shown you in one slide is that we can look at heart rate very clearly. We can see structural or cytotox internally control in real time. And I've kind of alluded to the relationship between amplitude and force, um, but the greater point would be next, which is can we assess contractility? And so for that, I want to emphasize that we really need to, and with AstraZeneca, we feel we need to focus on contractility because small changes in, in blood pressure can have an a, uh, enormous lifetime risk for stroke and heart attack. So what we attempted to do was validate this assay for contractility. And this is working off some work previously by Alex Harmer where he had validated an ion optics platform. And he had used 49 compounds including positive and negative ionotropes. And he found with ion optics that it had fantastic uh, validation metrics. And by that, I'm referring to some published criteria. The problem was that it's low throughput, and even more so that it uses adult dog cardiomyocyte primary cultures, which we'd really like to get away from from a three R's perspective. 
So we evaluated if it, to see if we could replace it with the human uh, stem cells, and we did it in both flipper and in pedant. So I think that's worth showing. And here you can see the potency relationship in the ion optics versus the impedance data. And you can see the potencies uh, correlate very well. Now, as for the validation metrics, the uh, flipper data uh, was not as good as, as your ion optics, but it was still uh, in, in the, quote, good range. When we looked at the impedance data with this same set, uh, it was back up into the excellent range in the 80s. Uh, so we felt like impedance was a, was a better assay, uh, but, again, which one you choose depends on s some of your criteria. As it happens within AstraZeneca, we use both. We use Flipper for routine screening because of its throughput, and we also use impedance because of its performance. It is worth pausing here for a moment, though, to highlight some differences uh, and how you can get really good quality despite some of the d important differences between ion optics and impedance. Both of those have the, the excellent... Uh, numbers on the validation metrics. One uses dog, the other uses human. One uses adult, whereas one uses fetal. One uses paste, whereas one uses spontaneous beating. And one uses imaging, whereas the other uses impedance. So we can get very good data despite these differences. And we often hear f folks focus on one of these uh, in particular, but I think um, it, it depends on your purpose. So, moving on then to another risk, arrhythmia, and uh, particularly non-HERG-related arrhythmia. And for this, I'll show uh, one slide, and it is uh, not data from AstraZeneca, but data from Roche, uh, Lian Gao, and Kyle Collage while he was there, and uh, several papers now, but I'll just highlight a couple of the key points. First, they selected a diverse panel of compounds, many more than are shown here, but you can see uh, that um, the, the types of arrhythmias uh, are very different within this set. What they calculated was a concentration of the drug that caused a 50% change in the beating. And when they used that metric, they found that they were able to detect uh, compounds that were both clean and uh, arrhythmogenic better than HERG or QT. So an integrated assay that includes all of the aspects, including the mechanical contraction, was more predictive, both positive and negative, uh, than, than the traditional assays. And they clearly conclude that it has superior predictivity for detection of clinical arrhythmias. I want to point that out. Again, it goes back to uh, this is good for detection, but if you wanted to follow up on it, you might want to use a different, more mechanistic study, depending on the type of cause and I would refer you back to their papers for additional reading. Now, I want to move on and talk about a few examples of changes in blood pressure and in idiosyncratic tox. And here, uh, first I'll show the criteria that we use to evaluate this. The criteria are, can we detect it earlier than in vivo or in the clinic? Can we determine mechanism of action on or off target? And if it's off target, can we drive SAR? The first example will be a MARC kinase inhibitor. MARC's phosphorylate tau. Tau is hyperphosphorylated in Alzheimer's. So if we could stop the hyperphosphorylation of tau, perhaps we'd have the first disease-altering treatment for Alzheimer's. The problem is that Merck published some selective and potent inhibitors of MARCs, and they dropped blood pressure in dogs. And here are a couple figures from their patents, and you can see as they dose escalate, the blood pressure dramatically drops. So can we determine if this is their chemistry or if this is a target-related issue? So we synthesized a couple of compounds that were potent MARC inhibitors. We picked two that differed in potency at MARC by tenfold, and as it happens, they both stopped the beating in the impedance assay with a potency difference of about tenfold. Now, this is published, and you can look in the publication and see that by several different measures, this did not kill the cells. It simply stops the beating. But this pharmacology clearly suggests it's on target. As an independent measure, we also did knockdowns, and you can see that Mark II and Mark IV, when knocked down, also 
decrease the amplitude of beating. And of course, pan knockdown of marks is even more dramatic. So both of these really strongly suggest that it's on target. One further way that you can evaluate this is with a pathway agent, and in this case, something that would alter microtubule dynamics. And you can see clearly uh, and in the paper there are a number of them, but clearly pathway-specific agents had the same effect. So we can conclude that we can detect it earlier than dog. We could drive SAR, but in this case, it's on target and we should stop. Now let me show you another example. This is check kinase inhibitors. And AstraZeneca um, stopped after going into the clinic and finding effects um, on, on heart beating. Sharing also went into clinical trials and stopped uh, for a similar reason. So you might suggest that uh, this is an on-target effect, but we'd like to test that. And so we tested both of these check inhibitors and found that they both stopped the beating of cardiomyocytes without any cytotoxicity. So, to see if it's pharmacology-related, we brought in a, a series of additional uh, published uh, check inhibitors, and we found that they had a wide range of potencies, some of them also stopping beating, but some of them not. So, is it pharmacology-related? And as it happens, with one exception, all of these compounds have potencies in the single-digit nanomolar region. So, they're roughly equally potent at check, but vastly different in their effects on beating. Now for check two, uh, again, no correlation. So it looks to be off target. Let's try the similar knockdown that we did for Mark. And you can see uh, knockdown of one or two or both has no effect. So to summarize this then, what we're finding is that yes, we can detect these findings earlier than in vivo, earlier than in the clinic. We can determine using pharmacological, genetic, and pathway specific agents is if it's on or off target. If it's off target, those assays all included error bars, you, even if you didn't see them, um, and so it was very robust and we could drive SAR. So I want to uh, tackle in the last bit one uh, final uh, risk, and that is around kinase inhibitor cardiovascular tox. And many of you may know that among the, no, uh, the uh, FDA-approved kinase inhibitors, uh, many of them are tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and many of them are cardiotoxic. So what we wanted to do is see if we could begin to sort of deconvolute uh, the kinases that contributed to cardiotox. And I will only take the two most extreme positions here, and the rest of it will be published uh, shortly. But those two extremes are that it is not a particular kinase, it's all about promiscuity, or the other extreme would be that it is only particular kinases. So first, in the promiscuity hypothesis, what we have done here is we have worked on the shoulders of Ambit, who very generously published 65 compounds with structures and identity and with uh, selectivity profiles across almost 400 kinases out of almost 500 in the kinome. And so then they, uh, these compounds come with, by definition then, uh, a selectivity score. And one hypothesis would be that as you go uh, have more promiscuous um, compounds moving to the right, your beat rate would be more affected. There is just a promiscuity correlation. Or it may be that there is a threshold. Once you hit a certain number, you have an effect on beating. Or there's no effect that it's all about individual kinases. Of course, there would be a slight trend, but not a clear correlation. And so Sarah Lamore, who did this work as a postdoc here, what she found was that there were some compounds that were quite um, selective yet had effects on beating and other compounds that were uh, quite promiscuous but did not have effects. So the promiscuity score was not a sufficiently um, useful tool. Um, she did go on, and it will be in the publication, to look at each family. Tyrosine kinases were not correlated. In fact, they were the, the, most, uh, the, the least correlated. But what she went on to do is take the other extreme, which is, are there particular kinases that are correlated with effects? And the answer was she found 46 that were. And um, here I'm showing that she knocked down each of those 46. And of those that she got uh, at least 75% knockdown, they're shown here. 
And 13 of those kinases, when knocked down individually, affected uh, beat rate. Uh, the identity of these will be revealed at the publication. And 19 different kinases, I might add, when knocked down individually, affected amplitude of the beating. So why did we not get all of them? Well, it might be that some of them were polypharmacology hitchhikers. An example might be something like Mark I and Mark II. Uh, maybe we don't have the compounds to distinguish between Mark I and Mark II, so you can't tell which is the real uh, contributor. Another possibility for not all of them validating is that perhaps 75% knockdown is not sufficient. Another possibility is that they are convergent. Trying the Mark example again, maybe it's that that Mark 1 and 2 are both correlated, and it requires that they are both knocked down. So the way I would interpret this data is that the individually confirmed by knockdown are, are clear positives, and they contribute. Those that didn't uh, confirm by knockdown may still be of value. So wrap up by saying that we started with some really diverse risks, and we started with a real gap uh, for primary and secondary screens. And where I think the, the field is moving to is we are able to uh, detect, we have the capability to detect these diverse risks, and we can move them earlier. We can follow on up on them uh, both in mechanistic as well as SAR studies. But your choice is driven by your, your need, whether it be primary or secondary screens. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions, as, as all of the presenters would. And thank you, Matt, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, you gave the audience an exquisite look into cardiotoxicity screening methods that will no doubt become an invaluable part of the drug discovery process in the very near future. Thank you again. Okay, we've received a number of very interesting questions from our audience, so let's take the first one. Okay, so let's get to our first question. Uh, the first question is for Blake. Uh, Blake, one of our audience members said they heard there's a newer version of I-cell cardiomyocytes available. How are they different from what was presented here? All right, well, these cardiomyocytes, the, the, new, the newer version are called the I-cell cardiomyocytes squared, and this is a, another version of the cardiomyocytes same from, made from the same starting material but it's ready to use after you thaw it much quicker. So these are typically ready, uh, these new cardiomyocytes are typically ready within four days of thaw rather than uh, a week or two post-thaw. So it's really the uh, same cardiomyocyte material. We've just optimized procedures for, for handling and quicker use. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so the next question is for Dale. Uh, Dale, this is sort of a two-part question. Um, one of our m audience uh, members wanted to know, uh, is it total or free CMAX that you were speaking of, and what is the effect on heart rate? So thanks for the question. The uh, CMAX noted is the total CMAX. So uh, the compound is highly protein-bound, so this may be a reason why the in vivo concentrations at which we see the effects are much higher than our in vitro concentrations. And interestingly, to answer the second part of the question, the heart rate in the dog telemetry study actually increases at 12 hours as opposed to decreases like in the MEA study. And that's at both 15 and 30 mg per kg. And additionally, in addition to the decrease, increasing uh, heart rate, there's also a concomitant decrease in pulse pressure at both of those higher concentrations. Okay, great. Thanks, Dale. Um, so next question is going to be for Matt. Uh, right here. Oh, here it is. Matt, um, you mentioned that uh, tyrosine kinases appear not to cause cardio cardiotoxicity. Uh, can you explain that a bit? Uh, sure. It's it's not that they don't cause it. It's just that as a group, um, we thought that the the um, kinases that correlated car with cardiotoxicity would be most concentrated within the tyrosine kinases. That was a hypothesis, and that's not what we found. In fact, as a group. Uh, they were the least correlated, uh, rather surprisingly. But that doesn't mean that there aren't individual tyrosine kinases that are perhaps very causative. Um, so it's a bit of context there. Okay, great. Thanks, Matt. 
Uh, Blake, it looks like we have another question for you. Um, one of our audience members said, you mentioned mechanical properties of the eye cells being phenotypically appropriate, but classical cardiac people are always asking about presence and function of T-tubules for correct contract, uh, contraction phenotype. Uh, do your eye cells have differentiated T-tubules? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, typically, the, the short answer is that the stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes, when cultured on that 2D, non-yielding um, uh, tissue culture plastic, they have the T-tubules, but they are not as fully developed as one would find from a freshly isolated prep. Um, so they are there for um, you know, phenotypically correct interrogation, um, but they're not going to be as fully developed as one would find in, in the freshly isolated preps. What we are seeing, though, is when maybe I would call them these second-generation culturing techniques of whether it's patterning or using 3D type of, of pattern structures, we're starting to see more and more um, morphological correlation with, uh, um, uh, what would, with what one would expect. So really, we're seeing limitations in the culturing techniques that are being overcome by these second-generation um, culture developments. So thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Blake. Uh, so our next question uh, for Dale again. Dale, what is your normal cardiovascular toxicity screening paradigm? So what we normally do is we actually use the automated patch clamp as our screening tool, which allows us to bin uh, the compounds based on their HERG inhibition. And we actually have a, a cutoff of less than 10 micromolar we consider high risk. And then from 10, 10 to 20 micromolar, it's kind of a, a it's possible risk. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it kills a compound, so it can go through the system, and if it becomes a higher-value compound, then we'll follow up with a manual patch clamp and also run the MEA assay. And then as we get closer to maybe a short-list candidate, we'll even go even further and do risk using a dog telemetry study if it's a really high value, and we're just needing to make sure that um, what we're seeing in the MEA and the patch clamp translate into in vivo. Okay, great. Thanks, Dale. Um, so... Matt, we have one more question for you. Uh, one of our audience members want to know, wants to know if you will publish the identity of the kinases associated with functional cardiotoxicity. Mm, yes, indeed. Um, that's being worked up now and should come out shortly. It will include both those uh, kinases that are appear to be causative as well as a subset that will uh, make up a predictive model. Okay, great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and looks like our last question is going to be for Dale. Uh, Dale, how does the MEA assay translate to human cardiovascular injury? Ah, good question. Um, so what we, we use the MEA assay to predict only our in vivo tox models, such as our dog telemetry studies. But we feel that since the dog is a very good cardiovascular tox model, the translation to humans should be there. However, we haven't run uh, compounds in their system yet that, have, that are, have been shown to have human cardiovascular toxic issues. But uh, one of our goals is actually to run some of those actually through the MEA and see if it actually uh, correlates with what happens in, in people. All right. Thanks very much, Dale. Uh, and with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived for six months on our website at www.genengnews.com. So if you missed parts of it, uh, you can watch it again, or feel free to forward the link to your friends and colleagues. Uh, I'd like to thank Blake, Dale, and Matt again for their informative presentations, um, and I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and thoughtful questions. Uh, and a very special thanks to CDI Technologies for sponsoring this webinar. So hopefully we'll see you again in another Gen webinar uh, in the near future. So goodbye for now.